In this lecture, I want to talk about some of the challenges that we face in thinking clearly. I talk about these in the textbook as well, but in this lecture, I want to expand on some of that uh, and talk about some of the individual research studies that have uh, led to some of the conclusions that we want to make. So we face a lot of challenges every day in being able to solve problems, uh, make good decisions, uh, make inferences and deductions. Uh, two of them that are particularly important and that I want to uh, talk about today are the challenges presented by multitasking and the challenge presented by thinking with incomplete evidence. So by multitasking, I mean the thing that we all do all the time. That is, uh, we do two or three things simultaneously. I'm sure most of you, uh, when you are listening to this lecture, uh, probably also have your smartphone uh, with you, and it may send up notifications. Uh, it may uh, send uh, Snapchats or uh, messages or Facebook messages or uh, any number, any one of a number of different things. So you got a lot of things competing for your attention. Uh, this is probably true if you're in a lecture in person. Uh, you're sitting at your desk, uh, sitting at the table. Maybe you have your laptop in front of you. Maybe you've got your smartphone beside you. Uh, and any of these things can be interferences. Uh, and uh, they can all affect your ability to make good decisions because they take away some of your attention. So that's one problem. The second problem, or the challenge, is the challenge of incomplete evidence. A lot of times when we make decisions, we just don't have all of the information in front of us. So imagine a student struggling to solve an algebra problem for their homework. Now, if they can remember the correct algorithm or a good example, the solution should come easily. Uh, but if they remember the wrong algorithm, the problem will be much more difficult to solve. So a lot of time, we just don't have the information that we need. Uh, this is going to come up in several different lectures uh, this term. Uh, when we talk about problem solving and decision making, we're going to talk about some of the heuristics or cognitive biases that result from not having all of the right evidence in front of us. So let's talk about multitasking first, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, some aspects of reasoning from incomplete evidence. So what do you notice? This is a photograph that I, this is not a photograph of anybody I know. This is just a picture I grabbed off of Google image search uh, when I typed in something like students with smartphones. Uh, you notice a couple of things. First of all, you should probably, I assume at this point, all react in horror uh, to the lack of physical distancing. Here are students sitting side by side without masks close to each other in a crowded classroom. Uh, this is probably what it's, it's probably fairly common for high school, right? Uh, the other thing you probably notice is that there are two people sitting at a desk. Each of them is sharing a laptop and they're each looking at their smartphones. Now, my guess in the article that accompanied this photograph is that they're using their smartphone as part of the instruction. These two students in the front are not uh, being distracted from the lesson. They're probably responding to a, a quiz or something like that. Um, but that said, you'll notice the two guys behind the two uh, people in front. Uh, he's got his phone on the desk. Uh, when I sit, when I give a lecture in person and I look out uh, at the students, most of you uh, would have your uh, smartphone on the desk. Uh, it would be sitting there, uh, probably face down, uh, but sometimes face up, uh, and it would be right in front of you. If it's face up, you're going to see some notifications come through. If I'm at a department meeting, professors all do exactly the same thing. So we're all really used to having a smartphone with us. Uh, this is relatively new uh, in human cognitive history. We've always multitasked. Uh, evolutionarily, we design a multitasking system or an attentional system that can focus on some things and screen out others. That's what multitasking does. Uh, but in an era when most of us have multiple devices in front of us, uh, researchers have been wondering whether or not this affects our ability to think clearly. So I want to talk about uh, one study uh, which looks at cognitive control in people who are media multitaskers. That is to say, they pay attention to more than one source of information. And then I want to talk about the general distractions about having a smartphone. So in this study, uh, the authors from about 10 years ago are looking at cognitive control in people who are media multitaskers. That is, uh, people who tend to self-report that they consume a lot of media. So they're 
their hypothesis was that people who have a habit of switching attention and multitasking a lot are going to have difficulty turning that ability off. In other words, if you like to multitask, if you watch movies while you have a phone in front of you and there's music going while you study or that type of thing, two or three different kinds of media going, it's kind of hard to stop doing that and to focus on things. Now, they don't get into the cause and effect. We don't know uh, whether that tendency causes some of the results that they found or whether there's a general tendency uh, to switch attention that then allows people to be high media multitaskers. So let me tell you about this study. Um, they've got two groups, and they ask them to self-report on their ability uh, or their tendency to multitask. Uh, so HMMs were one standard deviation or more above the mean on a self-report measure of um, media multitasking. Media multitasking questionnaires would be asking things like, do you uh, watch uh, television while you uh, read a book, or do you uh, listen to music while you're on your phone, that type of thing. Uh, so people who say they do a lot of multitasking are HMMs, high media multitaskers. At the low end of this index are people who are light media multitaskers. That is, they tend to not uh, pay attention to lots of things. They tend to pay attention to just one thing at a time. Uh, and one of the things they wanted to do was know whether or not these individuals differed on an attentional memory task. So let me show you the task on the next slide. So here's what they asked their subjects to do in one of the experiments. Uh, at the top of the panel, uh, you see um, a series of displays. So imagine seeing these on a computer screen going from uh, the left to the right. The first thing you see is, an, is a uh, X or a plus in the middle of the screen. That's the cue that you have to pay attention to. So you, that tells you to look at the middle of the screen. And then very quickly, for 100 milliseconds, you're going to see a series of blue and red bars flashing. That's what you need to remember. And your job is to remember the location of the red bars and not pay attention to the blue bars. Uh, the blue bars are distractors. So 100 milliseconds is about as fast as a person can uh, pay attention to something like that. Then there's a retention interval. That's 900 milliseconds. That's also almost a second. Uh, and then you get a test array. Uh, and the test array is you have to respond yes or no uh, to whether or not that is the original location of the uh, red bars. So in this particular case, the test array is no, that's not the, you know, you would answer no, those are not the uh, original locations because you see the red bar on the right-hand side is tilted in a different direction. So if you're doing this task and you're paying attention, you focus on the red, uh, you ignore the blue, uh, and then you try to remember the location uh, for a second to respond. So subjects are going to generally perform uh, pretty well. Uh, this is not an impossible task to do, uh, but there's certainly going to be some mistakes, right? Sometimes you're going to miss things. Uh, and in particular, they were interested in the effects of distractors. So that is to say, the number of blue bars that get in the way. They suspected that if people are high media multitaskers, uh, one of two things could happen. Uh, first, if they're high media multitaskers and they're really good at multitasking, uh, maybe they would be really good at not paying attention to the uh, blue bars. So the number of distractors wouldn't make a difference. If, on the other hand, if one of the groups, the high or the low media multitaskers, were particularly bad at uh, paying, at screening out some of the things they're not supposed to pay attention to, uh, then their performance would decrease as a function of the number of distractors. And that's what they found for the high media multitasker groups. Uh, you can see that in, uh, in the B panel, uh, performance is equivalent between the two groups. So the low media multitaskers are shown with the open squares, and the high media multitaskers are shown with the open triangles. Their performance uh, index uh, is roughly the same for displays where there were zero distractors. They only had to, they only saw red bars, no blue bars. Uh, when there were two distractors or four distractors, but at six distractors, which is the display that you see here, uh, when the number of distractors went up to six, the high media multitasker performance decreased. Uh, and you can see that there's a general pattern of decrease 
uh, in the high media multitaskers that is related to increasing the number of distractors. And the low media multitaskers show no such pattern. Uh, what this seems to suggest and what the authors argue is that individuals who self-report to be high media multitaskers tend to continue to multitask. Uh, in other words, they can't turn that habit off. Uh, they're used to switching around to lots of different things. Uh, multitasking in this case is actually a bad thing. Uh, if you're trying to only pay attention to the blue bars and you can't help yourself but look at the blue, sorry, if you're trying to only pay attention to the red bars and you can't help yourself but sometimes look over at the blue bars, that's when your performance is going to decrease. And they suspected that individuals who self-reported as being high media multitaskers uh, would uh, perform in that way. So this suggests that if you are really, if you really do a lot of media multitasking, if you tend to pay attention to lots of things, it's going to affect your performance further on down the road, even on really basic and low-level fundamental tasks like this. It might just be a cognitive style. Maybe you're used to paying attention to lots of things, uh, and it shows up in a task like this. So this is a spe very specific example of a very particular type of multitasking, media multitasking, and how it might uh, overlap with a type of habit or processing style uh, that makes, it, makes your performance decrease a little bit when there's lots of information on the screen. You find it a little bit more difficult to focus your attention because you tend to spread your attention and multitask. Uh, but I want to talk about another study uh, that looked at a general interference for smartphones. So in this experiment, uh, this came out uh, about two years ago uh, uh, from a researcher named Adrian Ward uh, at the University of Chicago. Uh, and they were interested in knowing whether or not having a smartphone nearby in and of itself could be a problem. Uh, so most of you, and again, just take a, take a look around. If you're not, you may actually even be watching this on your phone. Uh, it's a YouTube video, so of course you can just watch it on your phone. But let's assume you're watching it on a laptop or, a, or an iPad or something like that. Uh, or imagine you're being in a lecture. Think about whether or not you would probably have your phone on the desk in front of you. You probably do have your phone on the desk in front of you. In fact, as I'm recording this at my desktop in my home office, my phone is right there uh, where it always is. Most of us just keep our phone with us all the time. So Ward and colleagues wanted to know, would this reduce performance on some tasks? So they say, we tested this brain drain hypothesis that the mere presence of one's own smartphone can occupy limited capacity cognitive resources, thereby leaving fewer resources available for other tasks. They suspected that if the phone is there, people would just have difficulty looking away. In other words, it would kind of be analogous to the blue lines in the previous tasks. You would have a difficulty uh, completely ignoring it, even if it's not making any sounds. If it's just sitting there, uh, you might just occasionally look over and say, has anything happened with my phone? Uh, and that alone, that, that could be enough, that alone could be enough to be a distractor. They wanted to test this hypothesis. Let's look at how they did it. So they took a fairly large sample size. Uh, we got 500 participants. Uh, and the data uh, was over several weeks. And they asked their subjects to do several different tasks uh, in several different conditions. Let me tell you about those conditions uh, in the next uh, slide. So this is uh, a screen captured directly from the paper. So in the procedure, uh, they manipulated smartphone salience uh, by randomly assigning participants to one of three phone locations. Uh, either have it sitting on the desk, have it in your pocket or a bag, or in the other room. Uh, so three different conditions. You either have it right there in front of you, uh, you either have it in your pocket, or you leave it in another room. So participants in the other room condition left all their belongings in the lobby before entering the testing room. Participants in the desk condition left most of their belongings in the lobby but took their phones into the testing room for use in a later study. Once in the testing room, they were instructed to place their phones face down in a designated location. So everybody put it face down in front of them, just like you would normally at a desk. Uh, participants in the 
pocket and bag condition, carried all of their belongings into the testing room, and were told to keep their phones where they naturally would, but not on the desk. Um, so they divided these people into three groups. Uh, they were all told uh, to turn your phones completely on silent. This means turn off the ring and vibrate, uh, which, uh, let's be honest, in 2016, there were still people whose phones made noise. Uh, now, no one's phone makes noise, right? Almost all of us leave our phones off unless there's some reason we have to have it make noise. It's kind of rare. Uh, so we've got three conditions, uh, other room, desk, and pocket bag. So just now, which one do you think is likely to be the most uh, which one is most likely to interfere? Well, probably the desk condition. That's going to be their hypothesis. Let's look at how they tested it. So after participants entered the testing room, they completed two tasks intended to measure available cognitive capacity. One was called an automated operation span task, or the O-span task. The O-span task is a working memory and attention task, uh, and it requires you to keep track of numbers and letters uh, simultaneously. So you're doing small math problems while updating and remembering a letter sequence, and then at the end, uh, you're asked to remember the letters. Uh, so this is a task of attention and working memory, whereas the other task they asked their subjects to do uh, was a task of uh, general cognitive capacity, fluid intelligence. In other words, some sort of reasoning-based intelligence. This was a Raven's progressive matrices task. Uh, so one of these tasks involve, involves a lot of attention and working memory. Uh, the other task uh, involves uh, general fluid intelligence capacity. Uh, and what they found uh, for their first experiment uh, was that uh, participants who were assigned to the desk and the pocket bag condition performed significantly worse than subjects who left their phone in the other room. Uh, it seemed to be that having the phone with you uh, was enough to reduce your performance. Not a lot. So notice this score here is the number of letters you can recall. Uh, subjects who had the phone on their desk uh, were recalling just a little bit more than 30, uh, and the score for people who had their phone in the other room was 34. So this is not an enormous difference, but it's a significant difference given the sample size. Uh, and so this suggests that sometimes, if you're doing a cognitively demanding task, uh, having your phone nearby can be a legitimate distractor. Uh, they found that for the fluid intelligence task, uh, here they saw a slight difference. Other room, there was no effect. Uh, desk, there was an effect, but now the pocket and bag condition, so keeping your phone in the bag out of sight, uh, didn't seem to interfere with it. Now there's one caveat I want to add to this, and that is that we've worked to try to uh, try to uh, replicate results like this in my lab. Uh, and what we found is that it's much more difficult to replicate this than we expected. Uh, I, we've, we've found that subjects do not tend to, they don't seem to show much of an interference. Uh, when we replicated directly this O-SPAN task, uh, and we haven't published this paper yet, it's under... Uh, we're doing the data analysis uh, and writing up the paper now. Uh, one of my students, one of my grad students, found that when we replicate this O-SPAN task, uh, subjects in the desk condition don't perform any worse. One possibility uh, is that we've just, we're more accustomed, accustomed to having phones with us, and so therefore we've developed strategies uh, to not let them be an interference. Uh, we've tried to replicate this several times, and we're not finding very much. Uh, so this paper suggests that having your phone on the desk, it can be a small interference. Other work, the work from our lab, which is yet to be published, uh, suggests that maybe it isn't uh, an interference, uh, that most of us are pretty good at ignoring the phone when we have to. This could even just be a, a cohort effect. Uh, these data would have been collected in 2015 or 2016, uh, and our data were collected last year. Uh, that's not a big difference, but it's enough of a difference uh, to suggest that maybe people coming out of their uh, experiences as a high school student, also remember these are 
typically tested on first-year students, uh, have simply developed better strategies. Uh, they're used to keeping their phones out of the way. Or they know that their phones could be a distraction, and so they've gotten better at ignoring them. Uh, we don't know the answer yet. This is something we're still working on. But what's another kind of distraction? So what do you notice in this photograph? Well, a couple of things. First of all, again, I notice with horror that there are too many people sitting next to each other, uh, not physically distancing, uh, not wearing masks. Obviously, this photograph was taken before there was a pandemic, but you can see from looking at this picture exactly why we're doing online classes right now. This is a recipe for disaster. Uh, when there's a pandemic that's uh, an airborne spread virus. That said, uh, what's the other thing you notice? Everybody's sitting with a laptop. Uh, most everybody's sitting with an Apple laptop, but not everyone. Uh, so this is, this is not a photograph of Western students. This was just another photograph that I pulled from Google uh, when I typed in university students with laptops. Uh, and this came up. This is one of the pictures that came up. Everybody's taking notes on a laptop. You probably do the same thing. I do the same thing. I either use an iPad uh, or a laptop when I'm taking notes. Now, I like to take notes with a paper and pencil, but if I'm in a meeting and if, or if I were in a class, what I would do if I were you if, or if I were a student like you would be a student at a lecture, uh, I can imagine taking a laptop, downloading the notes uh, that were provided by the instructor and taking notes directly on a PowerPoint or sending a PDF over to my OneNote app and maybe writing on there with one of those uh, Apple pencils or something like that. So I can imagine uh, if I were a student, if I were in your shoes, I would probably have my laptop with me all the time. And indeed, most professors bring their laptops to uh, faculty meetings or research meetings or committee meetings and that sort of thing. We're just used to doing it. Uh, but some researchers have wondered whether or not this is a good idea. So I want to talk about two I want to talk about three studies uh, which have investigated this idea. Uh, the first is a paper that came out in 2014, and it made a huge splash for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's one of the first papers that looked at this issue uh, and whether or not taking notes on a laptop was better, the same, or worse than taking notes by hand. Uh, many people have suspected that taking notes by hand might have additional benefits, just the act of writing. Um, so Mueller and Oppenheimer wanted to answer this question. So that's one of the reasons it made a big splash. The second, uh, it's published in one of the top journals uh, in the field, Psychological Science. And the third, uh, it's got a really clever name. The pen is mightier than the keyboard. Uh, so they carried out several studies. Let me tell you about one of the studies in detail. I've got this whole paper, uh, the entire paper, uploaded on OWL. So if you want to read the whole paper, it's there. But I just want to talk about one of the experiments uh, in a little bit more detail. So we got 67 students in study one. Uh, it's not a large sample size, but it's sufficient. Uh, and these were Princeton uh, University students, uh, and they asked them to watch some short TED Talks. Uh, so you've probably seen TED Talks, and if you haven't, you can go to TED.com and watch some of the talks. They're kind of like university lectures. Uh, they're on a topic that's of interest, but not common knowledge. Uh, so students were asked to watch them, uh, and they were... Uh, after they were watching them, they, or while they were watching them, they were asked to take notes on a laptop or paper and pencil. Uh, so the laptops were full-sized, had keyboards, but they were disconnected from the internet. So they've controlled for any other interferences. They're literally just using their laptop with a note-taking app open. Uh, so our two groups, uh, one group takes notes by hand, takes notes by hand, the other group takes notes uh, on a laptop. And after they're done taking notes, uh, they're asked questions uh, about what they wrote. So let's look at some of the things uh, that they discovered. First of all, across all three studies, and I've just described the methods for study one, but there were three studies uh, in this uh, paper, uh, the number of words was always greater for people who took notes on a laptop. So that left-hand bar plot uh, shows you that the word count of note takers in all three studies uh, was higher for the group that took notes on a laptop compared to the group that took notes longhand. So if you take notes on a laptop, you just tend to write more. Uh, in addition, figure three, which is the figure on the right-hand side there, shows that there was a higher verbatim overlap for laptop, laptop note takers compared to longhand note takers. 
verbatim overlap means that uh, what they wrote when they were taking notes was almost word for word what the speaker said. That would mean that if you were taking notes and if this were an, a, a live lecture and you were watching me lecture uh, in person and you were taking notes on your laptop, you would write, if this were a large lecture and I were taking notes, you would write on your laptop. So you would tend to transcribe exactly what I was saying. Not everything. I mean, you can see it's only 14%, but that's a fair, that's a fair amount. So they were writing more words, and they were writing words that were more directly related to what the speaker said. You can see the longhand note takers were lower. So they didn't write as much, and what they did write tended to not be verbatim overlap. So on this account, it looks like taking notes with your laptop is better. You can write more, and you can write more that is directly accurate. However, uh, what they found is that when they asked questions afterwards, like, you know, multiple choice questions for what the speaker had said, uh, performance on those differed by a function of how you took notes. Uh, they had two kinds of questions. One kind of question was a factual question. In other words, direct recall of something the speaker said. The other kind of question was a conceptual question. Conceptual questions have to do with uh, understanding and integrating the information that the speaker said. So maybe drawing inferences or making connections across some of the concepts. In other words, the factual questions would be like a simple multiple choice question on an exam. And the conceptual question might be like a more challenging multiple choice question on an exam, one that requires you to go beyond the direct information that was given. Uh, what they found is that people who took notes by hand performed better on those conceptual questions. Now this is interesting because it suggests there's some advantage uh, for taking notes by hand. There's no advantage for taking the notes on the laptop. Now there's no difference for these factual questions. Uh, and perhaps that's because uh, laptop note takers tended to do a lot of verbatim overlap. Uh, so in that case, it seems like that's a beneficial strategy. They're not significantly better. There's just no difference. Uh, but there is a difference for longhand note taking. They found this for additional studies. So in study two, they even told their participants uh, to change their note-taking strategy. So here, the bar that's shown as laptop intervention, the laptop intervention group was told to take notes on the laptop, but they were specifically told to try not to transcribe things uh, because they were the authors suspected that what was making it difficult for the laptop, laptop note-takers was their tendency to focus on the surface of what the speaker said. In other words, the tendency to transcribe that that's fine for factual questions, but that's not good for conceptual questions because it means you're less likely to look at the deep structure or look at the underlying message. So they told these laptop intervention groups, they said, don't transcribe. Do your best to think broadly and to take notes and to integrate the information. Don't transcribe. Uh, but what they found is it didn't make a difference for performance on the conceptual group. Uh, you can see on the right hand that longhand note takers were still performing significantly better than uh, the laptop no intervention group and the laptop intervention group. Something about the act of typing out your notes uh, did not enable people to perform better on these conceptual questions. So uh, based on this, a number of professors uh, in 2016 and 2017, um, about a year after this study came out, uh, started to ban laptops from their lectures. Uh, there was one that was well um, publicized, an essay in the New York Times, an op-ed in the New York Times by a uh, sociology professor uh, in the University of Michigan uh, who said, you know, I'll be banning laptops from my group or from my large courses uh, because of this study. Uh, and she went on to give a lot of good reasons. Now, there's always exceptions. Uh, some students uh, need the laptop to be able to take notes. Uh, maybe some students are unable to write in a certain way or they require uh, assistive devices. So there are lots of exceptions. But the claim was that if we ban laptops from the classroom, uh, participants will be able to pay attention better and take notes by hand. Uh, it sounds great, but there are a couple of problems with that. Number one, uh, most of us do not 
learn information in exactly the way that this study uh, tested it. So when you see a lecture, uh, you're not immediately tested after that 15-minute lecture with factual and conceptual questions. Uh, you do what I probably do, which is you go back to your notes, right? So if you're taking notes online on a, a laptop, uh, you probably write the notes out, and then you go back when you're studying for the exam. You compare the notes to the slides that were given, or you compare the notes with your friend's notes, or you compare the notes with what's in the textbook, and you can fill in on it. Uh, that's a lot easier to do with notes that you've typed than with notes that you've written. Or uh, if you handwrite your notes, many people handwrite their notes and then go back and transcribe them uh, on a laptop afterwards. Uh, and of course, there are practical advantages to using a laptop too. If you take your notes with OneNote or Google Docs or something like that, you never lose them, right? Uh, you're not going to lose your notebook uh, if everything is backed up on the cloud. Uh, so there are lots of reasons why people still want to have laptops, even if it seems like uh, they're not beneficial. But there's another problem with this study. Uh, last year, uh, this study was, uh, someone tried to replicate this study. Uh, and it turns out with a much larger uh, sample size uh, and a, um, a, a more careful measurement uh, and across many different labs. So in this particular paper, I've linked, and I'll link to this in OWL, uh, I've linked to the preprint of the paper. Uh, so this preprint came out in 2019, uh, and the paper is uh, uh, has yet to come out in press, uh, but it's under review. Uh, this was replicated across, or attempted to rep be replicated across many different labs. So you'll see that the lead author, uh, Heather Urey, uh, worked with many different other psychologists in lots of other labs, lots of other universities, and many different countries. And they all worked together to try to replicate this study. And it turns out it doesn't work. Uh, when they do a much larger sample, uh, and when they do this full study across different uh, experiments, uh, they find no difference. So they directly replicated the study. They used the same kind of TED Talk intervention, the same kind of laptop interventions, uh, and what they found was on the next slide. So here's some of the data they collected. Now, they're not using the bar graphs. They're using what are called violin plots. Now, violin plots have some advantages from a data uh, science perspective over bar plots because they show the range of the data and the distribution of the data. Uh, so each violin plot uh, shows uh, the thick black line in the middle is the mean. So that's your average. Uh, the error bars are the lighter shading around the dark bars. The little dots are the individual measurements, so individual data. Uh, and then the area around those that looks sort of like a violin shape, uh, that's the uh, hypothesized distribution. Uh, so this shows you a lot more information, but it also shows you that for the um, factual performance, the upper left, uh, laptop and longhand do not differ. Uh, so the means are the same. That's what uh, Mueller and Oppenheimer found. Uh, for the conceptual studies, which is the top right uh, uh, plot, you can see that there's also no significant difference. Uh, subjects did not differ between the two groups. Uh, they did show that there was a difference in number of words. Uh, there, the laptop, uh, you can see that the laptop had a higher mean, and there were more people, uh, some people writing as many as 650 words. Uh, and they never in, uh, they never got close to that in the longhand group. So you can see that violin plot shows you not only the mean, but it shows you the spread of the data. Uh, and they also replicated the verbatim overlap. So their study replicated the things that uh, were much less uh, controversial. People with laptops do write more words. People with laptops do tend to have greater verbatim overlap. And even the means of those are comparable to what Mueller and Oppenheimer found. But when they ask them questions, factual questions and conceptual questions, they're not finding the difference. This is a well-done study, and although it's still in preprint form, uh, my read of this is that uh, taking notes on a laptop will not in interfere with your performance. Uh, so if you go to lectures and you like to take notes on a laptop, use a laptop. If you go to lectures and you like to take notes by hand, use longhand. Clearly, there's no difference. Uh, this study, which seems to be the most recent and best study of its kind, uh, suggests there's not going to be a difference. However, 
laptops can be an interference in other ways. So let me talk about that very briefly on the next slide. So this study, uh, which came out a few years ago uh, in a journal called Computers in Education, was run at McMaster University. Uh, and they were interested in whether or not laptops would interfere with the ability to multitask. So they weren't worried about your tendency to take notes. They were worried about whether or not having a laptop would interfere. Uh, so here, uh, they designed a clever study that was a way to sort of, I guess, mimic what people might, how they might distract themselves on a laptop. Taking notes on a laptop uh, in a class, in a large psychology 1000 class, uh, what kind of distractions might you find? Well, you might have other tabs open while you're uh, silently watching YouTube videos. You might have other tabs open while you've got Twitter or Facebook uh, or some social media platform on another tab. You might have other tabs open while you're uh, reading the news or catching up on something else or shopping uh, or looking for a vacation, uh, making lots of other plans. It's just the kind of thing that we do, right? Uh, one tab has your notes. The other tab has all of the other stuff. And what they suspected, and I'm sure is true, uh, is that subjects uh, would sometimes look over at that other information and that that could be a small distraction. So the way they did that as a control, uh, let's talk about how they set up the experiment. Uh, so they took uh, individuals uh, who were enrolled in an introductory psychology class. Uh, they asked them to take notes on their laptop. Uh, so they were recruited at McMaster the same way that you would be recruited uh, at Western. Uh, pretty much the same uh, technology. So we had a multitasking group and a no multitasking group. Uh, once they were assigned to these, uh, let's look at the next slide and we'll show you how, um, uh, how they tested it. So these were recruited from an intro psych class, but they were uh, tested uh, with sort of a pseudo class. So a 45 minute PowerPoint lecture on meteorology was created by one of the experimenters. Uh, in conjunction with a faculty member. So it was designed to be like a lecture, uh, and students gave a lecture. So if you were in this uh, study, it would be as if you were taking a uh, class, uh, and they were asked to take notes on their laptop. Uh, and for the multitasking condition, they also had a set of 12 online tasks. So while you were doing the lecture, while you're paying attention to the lecture, uh, you were also asked to answer questions. So what's on channel 3 at 10 p.m. Uh, and the online tasks were meant to mimic typical student browsing uh, during uh, class in terms of both quality and quantity. So you visit uh, websites, you look things up uh, while you're doing it. I mean, frankly, I'm not a typical student. Uh, I'm a typical professor, but that's exactly how I would multitask as well, right? I'd have three or four tabs open and I might my mind might think about something, and then I go to look it up while I'm in the middle of a meeting. Uh, maybe I manage to delete some emails. Maybe I go through some other stuff. So I'm flipping around between different tabs on my browser. That's what they're kind of asking people to do, but it's artificial. They specifically asked subjects in the multitasking condition to do it. Then they looked at whether or not uh, students in either of these groups would perform well on a, an exam, uh, so a practice exam. Uh, so after the lecture, you had to answer questions based on the lecture itself. And they found, not surprisingly, that people who were not multitasking did better. Uh, not a huge amount better, but significantly better. Uh, this should come as no surprise. If you are sitting in a class uh, and somebody's asking you, hey, what's on, what's on TV tonight? Hey, uh, what's a, well, what does it cost to get a flight to uh, Montreal? And then you switch back over. Of course, you're not going to pay attention. You're going to miss some critical information. And if you miss that critical information, you're not going to be able to remember it uh, on the uh, exam later on. So they found that to be the case. Multitaskers tended to perform just a little about 50% uh, correct, whereas the no multitasking group was performing about 65% correct. So a 10% reduction in performance for multitasking. Um, however, uh, that's not the most interesting part of the study. The most interesting part of the study uh, is that being near a multitasker is just as bad. Uh, so in one case, they interviewed people who were adjacent to multitaskers, so multitasking adjacent. On the top, you can see uh, one subject who was... Um, uh, seated next to someone who is not multitasking, doing fine. Uh, another subject is seated uh, next to someone who is multitasking. Uh, and 
in this case, uh, you would be sitting right behind uh, the subject. So it says the visual representation of participants who were in or not in view of multitasking peers. Uh, in view experiments were strategically in view participants were strategically seated behind two confederates. Uh, so you were seated behind two people who were part of the experiment. And the two people you would see would be like the people on the top or the people on the bottom. You would either see people taking notes or you would see people screwing around on the internet uh, while they're supposed to be paying attention in class. Uh, so you yourself uh, were just trying to take notes, right? But you were looking at somebody who was either taking notes or not taking notes. And what they found is that that actually had a pretty good effect on your performance. Uh, so just being seated behind someone uh, with uh, a laptop who is not using it to take notes can be an interference. Uh, now, when I teach about this in a lecture, I usually use this as a point to say, look, take notes online. I can see or on your laptop. I can see that most of you are using laptops. We've reviewed the evidence that suggests it's not an interference. It doesn't matter. However, if you're using your laptop, be aware that you can distract yourself by having multiple tabs open. And if you want to have multiple tabs open and you really want to try to multitask, I can't stop you, but be aware that people beside you or behind you could be distracted. If you're watching a funny video, uh, and someone is behind you seeing it, uh, clearly that's going to distract them as well. And so we need to be considerate. Uh, that makes no sense for an online lecture. Uh, we're not all sitting in a lecture hall. Um, but you can clearly see where that's going to be a problem, right? Uh, that could be a problem for you if you're sitting in a room with five other students, if you're working in, a, in your house uh, and your bed, you rented a room in a house with five other students. Some of them are studying, some of them are not. So uh, it's always a challenge to try to find a place where you can pay attention to the material to study uh, and have it not interfere. So when you're uh, not studying uh, and you've got a roommate, uh, clearly you want to make sure that you're not interfering with uh, your roommate's ability and vice versa. Okay, so that was one uh, kind of uh, interference. I want to talk a little bit more briefly now about the second, which is incomplete evidence. Uh, incomplete evidence just means that you don't have all the information in front of you. Uh, now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, we're going to talk a lot more about this uh, as we go on uh, in this class when I talk about heuristics and biases. But I want to talk about one very specific way in which we try to overcome this. The question is, do you use the internet, your phone, or a device to remember things? Well, I mean, that was the uh, example that people used, or the example that I used uh, when I talked about the uh, uh, multitasking and interference uh, example. So you get your laptop, you're trying to answer other questions in different uh, browser tabs. Most of us use the internet or the phone or a device to remember things. Uh, we might be able to use uh, Google or Apple to remind us of our next appointment. Uh, you might set parking location, uh, tells you where your par car is parked, uh, and you can help find your car using uh, Google or Apple Maps services. If you wanted to drop a course, and I asked you, do you know how to drop a course? Most of you would probably say, well, you go to the registrar site. Uh, I mean, who knows how to drop a course by memory, right? Most of us know where to go to answer the question, even if we don't know the answer. Uh, so if you wanted to drop this course, or if you wanted to drop another course, nobody expects you to know how to do that. You just need to know where to go to know how to do that. Uh, and the registrar's site gives you a step-by-step -step guide to course registration. This is a screen capture, uh, so I don't know if this is exactly how it looks now. My point is that we rely on the internet uh, to tell us things, uh, whether it's our own notes that we take in our calendar, or whether it's just knowing where to go to find things. This is referred to as cognitive offloading. It's a phenomenon that has been uh, known long before the internet, uh, but it seems to be particularly relevant to people who use the internet and their devices to remember things. Uh, and this just refers to the phenomenon of using technology of any kind to take on some of the function of human cognition. Writing things down uh, is cognitive offloading because you're using paper and pencil to remember things. Telling someone is cognitive offloading. If I know that someone else in my research group knows something, or if my wife knows something that uh, we're planning around the house, uh, we can be assured that it's, you know, 
as long as somebody knows it. She might know that I know something. I might know that she knows something. And we rely on each other to be a source of cognitive offloading. One person doesn't need to know everything. They just need to know where to get it. So the question is, if people engage in cognitive offloading to remember things or recall things, how might it affect their behavior in general? So this last study I want to tell you about, and this is the final study, we only have about three or four more slides, uh, is a clever study that tried to do that. So this was run a few years ago. Uh, this was uh, published in 2016 uh, by uh, researchers at the University of Illinois. Uh, this happened, this, I don't uh, work with this group uh, now, but uh, this was a group that was in Illinois when I was a postdoc there. Uh, so uh, they've continued, you know, it's a place that uh, this kind of work is uh, particular, of particular interest. Uh, and they wanted to know if using the internet to access information inflates future use. In other words, if you use the internet to answer questions now, do you develop a habit to do it in the future? So in one of their experiments, it's several experiments, uh, they asked a group of uh, res uh, research participants uh, to assign them into three different conditions, uh, the internet condition, the memory condition, and the baseline condition. And what they did was they gave them trivia questions. And one group, the uh, uh, internet condition was told to use the internet to solve the problems. So they were given a question, they typed it into a Google search, and then they answered it. And they were supposed to do that whether or not they knew the answer by heart. They had to use the internet. The memory group was always told to answer from memory if they could. And the baseline group, as we'll see in the next slide, uh, wasn't told to do anything in particular. So the experiment took place over two phases. In phase one, we only have the memory group and the internet group. The baseline group hasn't answered anything in phase one. Uh, in phase one, they're given a set of trivia questions like, who was the king of England during the American Revolution? Who was the first American, what was the first American state to secede uh, from the Union? Clearly, this is uh, done in the United States. These are all US uh, history type of questions. Uh, this is just a subset. Uh, so in one group, they were told to answer from memory if they could. Uh, the other group was told to always use the internet. Okay, so memory group, internet group. In phase two, then we ask uh, each group is given the choice. Uh, so group one, uh, which was always told to use the memory, uh, is told that they can answer from memory or the internet, whichever uh, they choose. So if they know the answer, they just respond. If they need to look it up, they can look it up. Group two, which was the internet group, is told the same thing. Uh, if they know the answer, they should just respond. If they need to look it up, look it up. And then the third group, which is the baseline group, was never in phase one. They're just told, answer it from memory if you can, or use the internet if you don't know it. So this baseline group is important because it tells us how likely are people to use the internet when they haven't had any particular prior instruction to do so. And they have a set of what they called easier trivia questions. These should be ones which are, on average, more likely to be able to be answered from memory. And here's their results from their first study. Uh, subjects who used the internet first were more likely to use the internet in the second phase. In other words, if they had started off with the instruction to use the internet, uh, they tended to continue to do so. Those who were told and instructed to respond using their memory uh, tended to continue to, well, a lot of the answers were answered by Google, uh, but they were less likely to use the internet. They still did it a lot, but they were more, they had more uh, tendency to respond from memory. But the important thing is that the memory group, the group that was told to use memory first, performed at roughly the same way that the baseline group did. In other words, it seemed as if the baseline group and the memory group did not differ. That gives you the general uh, sense that around 60 to 65 percent of the answers need the internet. Uh, and the other 40% of the answers, or 35 to 40% of the answers, can be responded from memory. But if you use the internet first, you are far more likely to use the internet a second time. Their argument is that you started to develop this habit. And the way they tested whether or not it was a habit uh, was uh, to change some of, the some of the circumstances around it. So in another study, uh, same type of questions, uh, same type of internet and memory uh, uh, intervention, uh, but in one condition, uh, they were 
answering everything while they were sitting at a desk with a computer. Uh, and people who were sitting at the desk with a computer were more likely to use the internet. Why not? It's right there in front of you. Uh, in a second condition, they were sitting uh, at, on a couch, on a sofa. Um, and uh, the computer uh, was available on a table across the room. So you had to get up from the couch, walk across the room, and type in the answer. You can see that the amount of effort that it takes has an effect. So people are more likely to try to answer from memory uh, if they can, because they, they can avoid standing up. And this is even higher uh, when subjects were in the sofa iPod condition, because here, in order to answer the question from uh, a Google search, it requires you to get up off of the chair, walk across the room, and then pick up a tiny little iPod touch uh, and type in the answer, which obviously no one wants to do because that's, uh, I mean, just the thought of using a little tiny iPod touch to try to type in the answer sounds unpleasant, right? It's got the tiny little uh, touch screen. Uh, so subjects were more likely to use the memory in that case. So you develop a habit to cognitively offload, uh, and that habit has something to do with the amount of cognitive effort and physical effort that it takes to answer the question. Um, so I want you to keep both of these things in mind. This was a, a longer lecture uh, than probably I had planned it to be, but they all seem to be that way. Uh, keep these things in mind when you're paying attention to other classes. Uh, when you're taking this course, uh, taking other classes and lectures in this course, or some of the information uh, that we've learned here could be applied to other classes. Uh, Cognitive offloading is very helpful. I mean, I use cognitive offloading all the time. I write things down uh, on lots of different uh, platforms, whether it's uh, using a Google Doc to track things, uh, different kinds of note-taking platforms. Uh, I ask my phone all sorts of questions. If you have a Siri enabled or you've got Google enabled, you can ask your phone questions while you're driving along, and it'll answer with questions, right? So I get used to depending on my phone to give me information, depending on Google to give me information. Uh, but it's a habit. The more I do it, the more I tend to do it. So be aware of those habits and whether or not they're helpful. And as well, be aware of some of the multitasking habits uh, and whether or not they're going to be helpful. Think about these within the context of System 1 and System 2. Uh, we're going to come back to some of these things later uh, in the 8th or ninth class when we talk about the role of co context, motivation, and mood. And if you've made it through all three of these lectures, now would be a perfect time to uh, respond to the discussion question, uh, which is on OWL.